All right, I have opinions and you are stuck with me for the next 20 minutes. I'm uh, Filippo Alsorda. Uh, I uh, maintain the Go Cryptography Standard Libraries, uh, which are not the topic of uh, today's talk, but in brief are a complete set of cryptography implementations that go from hashes to signatures all the way up to protocols, TLS, SSH. And that's why I care um, so much about randomness from a point of view of specification and implementation. At the end of the day, I'm an implementer. I am the final consumer of all of the specifications uh, out there. And I am the one who is in pain when those are hard to implement. And most importantly, I am the one that gets things wrong when those don't help me. And when I get things wrong, and my laptop has decided to go to sleep, so that's suboptimal. Let me just try to fix that. There we go. Um, now, uh, you should not trust implementers. I'm an implementer, you should not trust me. Uh, and that, mm, that is how a lot of uh, vulnerabilities come into in into the cryptography. They don't happen because the specification is wrong. They don't happen because of our, some new break in the, uh, in the underlying math, except isogenies. Uh, <laughs> but they usually happen because we make some mistakes when we're implementing it. So what we're going to talk about today is how can uh, we make the handling of randomness in specifications as implementer friendly as possible, as testing friendly as possible, as mistake friendly as possible, as misuse resistant as possible. So um, again, as an introduction, I work on the Go Cryptography Standard Libraries. I'm an uh, independent uh, uh, maintainer, and I work for a number of clients, including uh, pr Protocol Labs, who have an interest in the health of the Go ecosystem and who are interested in uh, the reciprocal access that we get from the high bandwidth um, conversations we get to have this way. I also maintain tools like uh, the file encryption tool AGE and make cert, uh, certificate uh, local, locally trusted certificate generation tool. Uh, I've been involved in the design of the Go Checksum database of TLS 1.3 and of Privacy Pass, which apparently was the topic of so many of the talks of this year's River Crypto, so I'm not going to uh, introduce it. Now, we're going. Uh, the message of this talk is to avoid just making randomness fall from the sky. And that's something that both um, people in theory, uh, in the theory side, academics, and specification authors tend to do a lot. Uh, at some point, you need something random. It would be great if there was something that never repeated, was perfectly uniform, and it just appears, right? Um, you just sample a distribution at random and move on. Uniform distribution, easiest thing in the land. No. No, 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 no. That is actually hard, and we need you to tell us how to do that, as well as making it easy to test things. Why? Well, we're going to start with a negative example. We're going to talk about ECDSA, because over the past few months, I had to re refactor our implementation of ECDSA in uh, the Go standard library, and I suffered, and so you get to suffer too. This entire talk, in a sense, I exists just because uh, I had to go through that pain, and I want that to not be the case for this new uh, generation of, uh, of cryptography that's getting specified now, including all of the threshold, post-quantum, and um, uh, higher-level protocols like MLS um, specifications. What's wrong with ECDSA? Well, ECDSA essentially s mm, says in the spec, if you can find it, because you try looking at the NIST spec and it tells you to look at the ANSI spec, and the ANSI spec is um, uh, paywalled. And so what you do is you figure out that actually the SEC1 spec happens to be almost word for word uh, compatible with the ANSI spec. Nobody really acknowledge that, but that's what you're supposed to use. Great, okay. So you find the spec and you look at it and says, oh, at some point you need a random number. So you need a nonce. So you, uh, that shall not repeat, but good news, it's big enough to s uh, select it a random. So just pick a random value from the scalar field. Easy. We call the random number from scalar field f uh, uh, a syscall of the kernel, right? There is no such uh, syscall in the kernel. Um, so instead, we have to 
do things to pull out a random number. There are uh, different degrees of wrong that can go, and the most wrong is you pick always the same. That is what the uh, PlayStation uh, firmware, PlayStation 3 firmware uh, signing uh, process was doing, and they produced multiple ECDSA signatures with the same nonce uh, over different messages, and congratulations, then you get to do math and solve for K. Can you guess what K is? It's the private key. You don't want to solve for the private key. Terrible outcome. Uh, they extracted the, the private key, made their own uh, firmwares, and flashed PlayStation 3s with uh, Linux because that had been removed as a feature. Uh, so, what's what did ECDSA uh, do wrong uh, for uh, to to lead to this outcome? We're going to, uh, to look at uh, at, it, at this from two sides. One is the properties it wanted from randomness, and one is the form in which it takes randomness. So we're going to start with the properties. And uh, for that, I'm going to uh, paraphrase a bit um, this famous article, which um, you might have read, is what color are your bits? Um, the, the idea of this uh, article is that things are not um, cre created equal, and where they come from can still um, there are differences between things that look the same. Uh, and in this case, it's more about uh, abstract differences, but random bytes can have very different properties. So when I hear that a specification needs something random, or needs a IV, or needs a nonce, I have no idea what exactly it's asking of me. Uh, it could uh, require it to be um, non-repeating, that's usually the lowest bound. Uh, if you reuse the same nonce twice, you're going to have a bad time. We all understand that. I understand that some schemes need that. We they need me to not uh, offer this, uh, not use the same input multiple times. There are some schemes that manage to even be misuse resistant on that. Um, the um, uh, ASGCM Civ, for example, the misuse resistant AADs manage to even defend against reuse. But I understand don't give me the same thing twice if I asked you for uh, randomness. Fair enough. But it gets much more complicated from there. Uh, for example, ECDSA, you might think, as long as you use different nonces for every signature, you're safe. That attack works because you do a subtraction and two equal things cancel out, and suddenly you can solve 4K. But in fact, ECDSA requires much more than that requires the secret to also be uniform. Sorry, the secret, the um, uh, nonce to also be uniform. If your nonce has a bias, so its top bit is always zero or it's always re reduced by uh, the wrong value, lattices happen. And honestly, I have I to this day to not understand those attacks, but I'm told that lattices happen and then again the private key falls out. So it's unforgiving. It has to be a completely uniform distribution of random values. Now, that's a much higher request. If you uh, have a bad implementation of a random number generator, it might still manage to eke out something a little different every time. But you might, for example, I don't know, pull the wrong number of bytes out of the generator, or you might do the rejection sampling wrong, uh, and you might end up with a bias even if you're always using different values, and ECDSA breaks. That's bad, because as I said, implementers make mistakes. Asking them to get uniformness right is a much higher bar than asking them to get non-repeatedness right. Then there's secrecy. Does a random value need to be secret? Again, in specifications, you don't even know. In, specific in specifications, sometimes there's just, oh yeah, just pull some randomness from the ether, let some randomness fall from the sky, and it's randomness. Nobody knows it. N it's and then you stop using it, so nobody can learn it, right? Wrong, because we have side channels, and we have memory dumps, and we have all sorts of things that can go wrong. We have weird execution environments where some of your memory is secret and some of it is not and then somebody comes along and breaks SGX anyway, but that's an another story. Uh, still, it's not always easy to keep things secret that you're using, and it's important for us to know whether you need us to keep something secret in the future or not. Then there's unpredictability. 
again, you can make something never repeating, but very predictable. Uh, if it's just an ounce, I can just do use one, two, three, that's obviously not uniform, but um, it's also predictable. Is that okay, is that not okay? ASCBC, it can't be uh, predictable, uh, but and it has to be uniform, but it doesn't have to be secret. You see how there are so many dimensions in what a random value in a cryptography specification can have to be. So what the first thing I need to know as an implementer is what properties do you need from this randomness? Does it have to be non-repeating? Does it have to be unpredictable? Does it have to be secret? Does it have um, to be... I'm missing one, there's so many. Uniform. Uh, and <coughs> if we don't know, we are going to suffer. Now, you could say, now just a uh, random number generator is a solved problem. Just call get random in the Linux kernel, and there's equivalents in most uh, kernels this day. Just pull that out, then wipe it after you're done, and that should be it. I'm here to tell you both I agree, and that's what everybody should do. We should not have uh, everybody talking of implementers that uh, deploy to major platform. We should not be reinventing our wheels. We should be using the uh, APIs that we have. But in practice, your implementers will have either weird constraints, difficult platforms, or just inexperience. Because for every specification out there, uh, there's going to be hundreds of implementers. So instead of going implementer to implementer to, uh, to tell them, here's how you do randomness right, I'm trying to come to the specification outers and tell them, please make randomness as forgiving as possible. However, you can go one step further of just telling me what you need from randomness. What you can do is make your requirements much lower by using something you already have in the protocol. In this case, in case of ECDSA, there is a much better way to do ECDSA, which is RFC 6979 uh, by uh, Thomas Pornin. And what this uh, specification does is say, look, uh, you have a private key, which is secret, a message, which is non-repeating for, uh, uh, for different messages by definition, if the message is the same, then it repeats, but as long as the messages are, yes. So what you can do is take the nonce, hash it together with the private key, hash it together with the message, and what you get out is going to be uniform because it's the output of a hash function. It's going to be non-repeating for different messages because the message is in there. It's going to be secret because if it's not secret, I have very bad news about your private key anyway. Um, and so you can use that to make even a deterministic signing scheme out of it. Now, do we want deterministic um, signature schemes or do we want uh, randomized signature schemes? Whole other conversation. That's not what I'm talking about. You, this recommends a deterministic um, scheme. We've learned that that's not actually great because fault attacks and sometimes you get the, a the API wrong and you take like the f wrong public key with the right private key and you mix those. That was a very interesting EDDSA API vulnerability recently. But point being, you can make a randomized uh, signature scheme by just taking some randomness and then hashing it together with all of these things. What did we gain by doing that? We gained that even if that, that randomness suddenly has to only be non-repeating for, uh, for you to get a, random, uh, a randomized signature, and even if it repeats, everything that happens is that you get a deterministic signature. You see how wide a difference in outcomes it, um, this has done. If ECDSA was specified like this from the start, we would not have had so many vulnerabilities. It would not have been possible to jailbreak the PlayStation 3. It, I mean, which, anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, so this is called in different ways uh, by in different um, areas. Uh, I call it hedging. Uh, some people call it uh, hybrid um, signatures. There's uh, different ways to call it. The point being, if you have already w ways to reduce the requirements of random inputs, please put them in the specification. And don't say, well, that's a thing implementers can do, right? Like, you're an implementer, you can just do all this, like, put stuff inside their RNG and then use that as your RNG. Well, first, that makes 
uh, theoretical proofs unhappy because suddenly stuff depends on stuff that didn't depend before. And second, you are trusting the implementers. I'm here to tell you not to trust me. I'm here to tell you to instead tell me exactly what to do. If this was part of the specification, we wouldn't have gotten that uh, vulnerability. But it's unlikely to help the fact that it's a technique available when the point is we're trying to avoid implementer mistakes. Great. So this is the part that I care the most about, hedging at the specification level. If you do have secrets, if you do have no repeating stuff, hash them, uh, tell me exactly how to derive things. And mm -hmm. um, that leads uh, uh, us to the second ask that I have of specifications as regard to randomness. The other problem of having randomness from the sky that falls halfway through um, uh, a process is that it's very hard to write known answer tests for it. These are tests from the Weichproof project. Um, they are just a giant JSON file uh, that uh, gives you inputs and expected outputs, valid or invalid, for, um, for various algorithms. And we can use these to test verification of ECDSA because you know we get the public key and the message and the signature, and if it says invalid, we make sure that we don't accept the signature. But we can't use it to test signing because signing is randomized. Now, am I making an argument for deterministic uh, signatures? I'm not. Randomness can be just another input to a, to a deterministic lower, lower level function. You can define your randomized signature as a high level thing uh, that invokes a lower level core API, let's call it interface, let's call it whatever we want, calling it with 32 bytes of randomness. And from there on, it's deterministic. And we can write known answer tests for that layer. And in here, you would just have one other line that says, here is the randomness input that we use to produce this signature if it was valid. These are invalid. But the valid ones, we would have the randomness that you're supposed to use to generate that value. And now, suddenly, we can write known answer tests. This is the thing I keep talking about. We want more tests, because, and tests that we can reuse across implementations. Because again, we can write our own deterministic RNG to write our own tests, um, uh, but then it's probably not the same RNG as the other implementation. And so we can't share test vectors, and so they will think about something that I didn't think about, and I'll think about something they didn't think about, and we will not cross-catch these bugs. Bonus points if those tests are even in the spec, of course. Now, that has an another advantage. The other advantage is that it specifies exactly how to go from what we actually have, which is 32 bytes of, uh, of randomness, to what you need. ECDSA, again, needs a random value from 0 to Q. How do you get a random value from 0 to Q if you just have uh, RNG that generates bytes? You look at the spec, it will tell you, right? In fact, the ECDSA spec does tell you two different ways to do it, which again makes it hard to test because I need to write test vectors for both. One of them is reduction, the other one is rejection sampling. Now, do I have opinions on which one is better? Yes. Am I going to even tell you? No, because my point is not what specific thing you put in your, uh, in your spec, as long as there is something in the, as long as the spec goes from bytes to bytes, like go covers the entire protocol. The other reason to do this is that sometimes people will need determinism where there wasn't determinism. For example, um, some MPCs. There, uh, the Zcash MPC, um, Powers of Tau, the, the one, not the latest one, the previous one, uh, needed, uh, the ceremony needed multiple nodes to uh, derive a, a number of points on a curve from a seed. And um, how you derive those became part of the protocol. And how they did that is that they said, well, we take the seed, use it to see the ChaCha20 RNG, and then pass the RNG to our function that takes our RNG and returns a point. Elegant, Rust traits, run traits, super type safe, great. And then they, were, they told me, hey, we want um, two independent implementations of this because it's MPC, so we can avoid the trusting trust issue if 
mm, you write one in Go that has nothing to do with the Rust one. And I wanted to write it without even looking at the Rust. But then I get to that part, I'm like, wait, so exactly how do I turn random bytes into this? And the answer, <sighs> that's the order you have to sort the bytes in as they come out of the uh, RNG. Because they get re read in one engine, then they go into a uh, trait that takes you in 32s uh, and splits them into you uh, in 16s or whatever it was. Those are different engines, and then they get rearranged as limbs by the field implementation in a different engine. And so you keep flipping and you're playing the three card game to r r sort the bytes. And that's part of the protocol now. Yes. So how could this be avoided? by defining in the abstractions, for example, for the elliptic curve they were using, a way to turn bytes into an element. And that is what Restretto 255 does, for example. That's way too small. Um, thank you for scrolling off what I wanted to show. Um, there you go. Element derivation. What this uh, says is you have 64 bytes. You want an element of the Restretto 255 field, uh, field group. And how do you do that? we specify exactly how you're supposed to do that. And exposing these things in the abstractions helps not reinventing the wheel in every spec. And then the specs can say exactly how to go from randomness as bytes to whatever random thing they need. So now a specification that needs a random element of a prime order group can say, we take 64 bytes as input uh, of randomness, and we pass them to this. Ideally, it will even hash them together with some other stuff that's in that protocol, whatever protocol that is, so that they reduce the requirements. Because this needs to be uniform. Because Restart of Fi doesn't have hashes, it's a very low level um, abstraction. But still, wh what it, uh, it allows is avoiding that emergent specification effect that we just saw. Another um, trick I really liked was um, the classic McAleese uh, private key generation um, can fail. Uh, you can try to make a private key and it might abort because it, the matrix doesn't come out right, I don't know. Uh, and when that happens, they specify that you hash the input and try again with the output of the hash. Now, why is this clever? Because you do that once, but then to serialize the key, you just take the final value you used and you save that on disk. Key generation and key deserialization are the same function. Simply, key generation might have to reissue, while key deserialization knows that it's probably not going to reissue because when you were doing key generation, you did the retries and eventually saved only the final value. I really like that trick. And I like it because it tells me exactly how to go from bytes to my random output. And speaking of key generation, uh, th that's the last thing I want to cover. Uh, key generation is one of the most important things you can get wrong, because you get key generation wrong, you are unlikely to succeed at anything else. Uh, I mean, you're unlikely to have anything else being secure. And yet, we have basically no known answer tests for any key generation algorithm. ECDSA just tells you, yeah, you just pick a random scalar and then multiply it by the base point, and now you have a public key. Congratulations. It, it, OK, uh, do I do rejection sampling? If I'm doing rejection sampling, can it fail? Well, on P256, yes, it's 2 to the minus 32. That's entirely possible. On P521, no, it's 2 to the uh, minus 200 something. Uh, so. For P256, you could write a known answer test for rejection sampling failing, and that is what we did uh, in our code, but it's just a test that we had to write for ourselves. You see that we have a little hook here to notice that looped, and we are asserting in the test that we are observing a loop where we know it's possible. But it's a thing we wrote for ourselves. Is it correct? I think it's correct, but it would be much better if it was in a set of known answer tests. Because again, this is something where randomness just falls from the sky. Instead, I very much want randomness in specifications to be specified from deterministically from a set of random bytes all the way to the output. And I think this is pretty much it. The only other important thing is 
how large that value is. The uh, AADs get this wrong by asking us for a non-repeating value and then giving us 96 bits of space. And so we're having all these very exciting conversations about, okay, how many messages can I actually encrypt uh, before randomly uh, picking that becomes a problem? And we all take a guess, and then five years later, we're obviously using the system for something else, and we have to go back and say, oh, huh. Well, that's not going to work. So yes, uh, ma make the values large, um, ma make them uh, possible to select randomly, but then require only non-repeatedness, and we will make way, way, way fewer mistakes. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions, happy to answer them now or in the break. I mean, so so far you mentioned, of course, this uh, well-known mistake uh, in between kind of non-repeating and truly random. I'm just curious if, uh, is in your experience, so you ex you encountered something where People did get the non-repeating part right, uh, but kind of in practice, uh, um, you know, the system failed because it was like not truly, really, you know, not uniformly random, you know, because there is a big gap between non-repeating and uniform randomness. There, there is indeed. So I don't want to keep just pouncing on the uh, ECDSA, but um, that has been exploited on the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. Uh, there are certain the Bitcoin blockchain can be uh, thought of as the biggest collection of ECDSA signatures uh, from also ca sometimes objectionable implementations. Uh, and mm, there are attacks that use lattices to extract the recover the nonces when the nonces have some bias, even if the nonces don't actually repeat. Uh, what's hard there is that, that when they repeat, you see it in the signature because half of the signature repeats when the nonce repeats. Um, if it's non-repeating, you can't see it, uh, but you, if you know that uh, those are from the same implementation that has some bias, then you can do lattices and uh, things fall out of it. Um, I'm thinking of another case where I remember things were... I think I remember a couple cases where the other way around happened, uh, where things only needed non-repeatedness, and things went a little wrong, but at least there was a little bit that was different because maybe the time was in there. And now, do we like that? No, 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 no. we don't want to rely on time for entropy. But sometimes that saves you because, oh, I guess that's predictable and everything else, but there's a timestamp in it and we weren't using it at high enough rate that it was still non-repeating, and so we're safe. That that's a very good result for a specification to fail so gracefully. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I strongly agree with the both de-randomize your, your signatures and use system randomness in them. I, I would actually be say something even more extreme, which is you should try and make, you should kind of hide the input for the, the system randomness. So make it an optional in input and then have your signing method actually go to the random yes. or something like this. Just and call or call it something like test an optional, you know, test vector random yes. or something like that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, um, I was talking about what to do for specifications. If you're instead writing APIs, uh, you should probably not even talk about randomness in your external API. And when you sign gets called, it goes to get random, gets a randomness, and calls the lower level sign function. And that one is the one that you test with the known answer tests. Uh, the important thing is that the specification still needs to have a clean abstraction break at that layer f with the randomness as a well-specified determ uh, in deterministic input, well, non-deterministic, but uh, s specified uh, input, so that then you can deterministically test that function. But I agree that the best APIs, high-level APIs, don't ask the randomness to the final user. Right. One of the things, one of the very funny things this saves is sometimes there are devs who will think they can have secret keys in a, in a, in a context where they don't have system randomness, and this catches them, and then, you know, it yep. prevents all kinds of bizarre things. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and that's another reason I want um, f inputs that might be conceivably be random to be as lar large enough to be always random. Because for AADs, I can't do that because I don't know if my user is going to encrypt a million messages, in which case random 96 bits are fine, or a few billion messages, in which case, no, I can't uh, generate it for them. So that's why it's important to make things large enough that mm, the birthday bound is not a concern. 
Cool. Well, thank you very much, Philippe. Thank you. Thank you.